Uh, as all of you know, my name is Sam Stakely. Um, my project is a little bit technical, so the way this is going to be structured, um, I'm going to spend a lot of time explaining this term and this term, uh, because once we understand smart grid and demand response, the project itself is very straightforward. It's very simple. Um, so actually, I have a question. Who here has heard the word smart grid before I said them? OK, a lot of people. Who could give like a definition? Of smart grid. <laughs> Ooh, would it be like an electrical grid that responds like uh, to, to high demand or low demand and like produces more or produces less? Is that sort of like the that actually that is a characteristic of smart grids. Um, not exactly a definition, but you'll see it's very close. There's going to be a definition in my presentation. Ten points. Um, yeah. So today I'm going to be talking about the electrical grid infrastructure. Um, I think most of you know what I'm referring to, but to be clear, the grid refers to the cables, wires, transformers, and other equipment that are used to distribute electricity from where it is generated to where it is consumed. Now, something you may not know is that this grid infrastructure is absolutely critical to achieving the vision of a sustainable future that I think that we all share. Right, Wind and solar power have made huge steps forward in recent years, but they haven't seen the widespread implementation that we expect. I'm going to show you why the grid infrastructure is the crucial challenge to achieving the sustainable future. So what do we need for our vision? We're going to put together a wish list of things that we need to make the sustainable future happen. So if you look over here at this chart, we've got a 24-hour grid profile of a typical day in California. You can see here, up here, this is uh, the total load that's consumer electricity demand measured in megawatts varying throughout the day. Um, and then down here is solar output, so output from a solar power plant, solar panels. You can see the output or the generation comes up with the sun and sets with the sun as well. So the first thing to note is that all of this space here between the two curves, that's all bad because this is demand that we can't meet with our solar production, right? So we have to fill that demand with typically fossil fuels, uh, like natural gas power plants, for instance. So the first thing we want to do is we want to boost our solar production, right? We need higher renewable energy output. So this is, this is a good step forward. There's still one problem is there's still these areas out on the side, right? The sun only shines for part of the day. Um, but at least while the sun is shining, we can fill all of our demand and more with the solar power output. Now, a more subtle problem with this is actually this space here is also a problem. Instead of too little electricity, we're actually producing too much. Now, the way that the grid works, the consumption, or sorry, the generation and consumption of electricity is completely coupled. At the same instant that electricity is generated, it must be consumed, must be dissipated. So that means that all this space here is simply going to waste. We're not making inefficient use of our power infrastructure because of that wasted space up there. <sighs> That's tough. So what, what could we do about that? <laughs> Suppose we had a big battery. And during the day when the sun is shining, we're going to send our excess power to charge this battery. So here, while the sun is shining, it's not outputting. Right? We've got battery output. It's not outputting, but it's charging up. And then when the sun goes down, we output using the battery. And there, we've managed to capture this power that was wasted before, and we're actually making use of it while the sun is not even shining. This is great. So we're going to add storage to our wish list. This now, finally, is a viable scheme for this vision of a sustainable future, right? If we just, if we imagine that the solar output were even higher, we could wait until about 8 AM. Once the sun comes up, run the grid totally on solar, send the excess to the battery, and if we had enough solar production, we could run the grid all night on the battery. And we would just repeat the same thing the next day. This would be minimal reliance on fossil fuels. We would only need the natural gas plants on shady days or in cases of emergencies. This is awesome. So why aren't we already doing this? We have the technology to make solar panels. We can make batteries. We can make really big batteries. What's the, what's the problem here? So the problem actually is that the way that I presented this, there's an illusion here. 
Um, this scheme is currently impossible with the way the grid infrastructure is. And the reason for that is that this data that we're looking at on this chart is not available to power system operators in real time. You can collect this data after the fact, but it is impossible to access this data in real time. That means you can't see your solar output coming up. You can't see the total load fluctuating throughout the day. You can't see that point where they intersect. You don't know when that is. So you don't know when to start sending your solar power to the, do you send it all to the grid? Do you send some of it to the battery? For that matter, how much do you send to the battery and when? When do you turn on your natural gas plants and when do you turn them off? These are all questions that are critical to our sustainable energy scheme, but they're currently impossible to answer at the decision time. So we need to add another thing to our wish list, which is real time data and automation. With this data, this scheme would work perfectly. If we had computers in line with the grid infrastructure, in line with the wires, those computers could have sensors that would show us this data. And in fact, while we're at it, we have the computers. We could automate the whole thing. We could put it in computer code. This would all run automatically. We could do it every day forever. If we only had the data. As I said, the grid infrastructure today, the prevailing grid infrastructure, does not have this data called dumb grid. It doesn't have any of the computer intelligence. So what we need is smart grid technology. So for a definition of smart grid, um, a smart grid is an electricity network that uses digital technology to monitor and manage the transport of electricity from generation to consumption. And with smart grid, we get some key benefits. The first and foremost being that it's going to enable this large scale transition to sustainable energy, pending some other technological things, but this is a major problem in the way. You also get some efficiency benefits uh, for technical reasons where you do end up actually saving money with a smart grid. Um, but really the important thing is the renewable energy sources. This is amazing. We could actually finally see the majority, if not the vast majority, of all electricity consumed being produced from uh, energy sources like wind and solar. That's awesome. Maybe we can do even better, actually. Let's go back and see. What else could we improve here? Let's see if we can do more. So this isn't obvious, but there's a, actually something else about this chart that's kind of suboptimal. And it's actually the shape of this total load line. The fact that it goes up and down like that, it's not good. Um, and the reason is it relates to what we might call peak demand. If you're a power system operator, you have to be able to meet the demand, obviously, that your consumers request of you that's in your contract. In particular, you need enough infrastructure, right? The more power, the more infrastructure you need, more cables and wires, transformers. You need enough infrastructure to meet the most demand that any consumer could ever ask of you, right? Uh, otherwise, you uh, face having power outages, rolling blackouts. Um, but that means that, it, let's suppose this was the peak demand. During all this time, when the total load is lower than the peak demand, it's kind of a waste, because you have all this infrastructure that is designed to deliver that much power, and you're only delivering this much power with it. That's inefficient. So, uh, but, so what would we do? I, I guess the only thing we could do is what if we just changed the line? So we didn't change the overall demand. The area under the curve is the same. The total amount of demand is the same. All the same things are happening. But we just changed the shape. So the shape through time, right? Before we had this peak over at 6 PM, we had a dip at 6 AM. We moved some of those tasks around. Now, this would be great. If we could actually have a total load line like this, we would see a huge efficiency boost. And uh, the power system operators would not have to make these same uh, enormously expensive investments in infrastructure that aren't being totally used. So we can add this to our wish list to reshape the load line. Now, this may sound kind of far-fetched because, right, when I said we, we move the tasks around in time, well, what does that mean? I mean, this line represents people's demand, but the nature of people's demand is that they demand it whenever they demand it, right? Somebody, somebody from 
doing something at 6 p.m. change their time to 6 a.m.? How, how can we make somebody do that? Well, we don't make anybody do anything. Actually, they're going to do it willingly. And this leads into the next idea, which is part of Smart Grid. It's called demand response. So the essence of demand response is that uh, consumers in the electricity market uh, on the demand side respond to the market conditions and become active participants in the market rather than simply passive consumers. Um, and I'll, I'll explain how, how that works in a second here. Um, but this is what's going to allow us to get the benefit of more efficient and stable electricity distribution going from this inefficient load to an efficient load. So how does this work? Like I said, we're not going to make anybody do anything. Um, but here's an example. So recall that going from the inefficient load to an efficient load represents a cost savings to the power operator. Let's just say, this number is too small, but let's say that going from here to here saves the power system operator $1,000, right? So that means that if they save $1,000, then they would actually be willing to pay their consumers to reschedule loads, right? Say they could, say, uh, they could pay $500 to a group of consumers who shifted around their tasks to make the load look like this. They would be willing to do that, right? And everybody wins, right? The consumers get their same electricity service, more or less. Um, but, right, they're agreeing to this change. Obviously, they're amenable to the change. Uh, they get the $500, and the power system operator nets $500 because of the $1,000 uh, operating costs savings. So this is the essence of demand response. Um, now, of course, in reality, the power system operator is not going to call up on the phone the consumers and like offer them this exchange, like, hey, do you want to change your washing machine to 6 a.m.? No. Um, the way this actually will work is that there will be a centralized computer system where the consumers will agree to relinquish some control of, of their uh, tasks to the power system operator according to a demand response contract. So. Uh, this, uh, the, the demand response agreement whereby the exact uh, characteristics of what the power system operator can change, how much they can rearrange your tasks, which tasks they can rearrange, this will all be laid out in a demand response contract that's going to be part of the contracts probably that you sign with the uh, power utility. Um, and this is going to lead to a, a market of these reschedulings that is going to use the is going to use the power of market forces to organize a smarter and more efficient consumption from all consumers. So let's talk about these demand response contracts for a second. Let's see how they're structured. Um, so first, you have a set of control parameters. Control parameters means what appliances does the power system operator have control over? Um, how can I change them around? If, if you set your washing machine at 8 p.m., uh, you want it done by 11 p.m., we can put that in the contract, right? We say we give a three-hour window for that process. And as long as it's done at the end of that three-hour window, that's fine. So that's, that's one example of a, a, uh, a type of control parameter. Another might be if there's a time of very high demand when, the, when it, uh, it is very valuable to the power system operator to lower demand, you might say, um, I'm okay if you shut off the lights in my house. It's during the, maybe it's during the middle of the day, um, I don't need light, whatever. Uh, this could also be, for instance, in industrial applications in uh, you know, certain industrial places where there's some non-essential processes um, that can be uh, you know, turned on or off um, in exchange for this uh, financial incentive. Um, next, we have incentive structure. So how are the, how are the incentives uh, structured? Um, it could be, for example, that the, uh, the base rate cost of your electricity service is simply lower to reflect your demand response participation. It could be that every time that you agree to participate in demand response, you get a cash payment or you get a reducement, uh, a reduce, reducing, reduction <laughs> of your power bill that month. Um, or it could be, it could, there could even be a provision that says, um, I know I agreed that you could shut my lights off at 6 p.m., uh, but today I need my lights, so I'm willing to pay a slightly higher rate today because there's a high demand. 
um, for my lights. This is similar to like Uber surge pricing. Mm -hmm. um, so you could have this sort of dynamic pricing model. It could get very interesting. Um, and then lastly, a power utility needs a set of contracts, right? You need to have different options for people so that they can uh, choose their different preferences. Some people won't like demand response. Some will be really into it. Um, some will really be uh, into the financial incentives. So you want to give people a different range of options. But you need to make sure that there's not too few options because people want choice, but there's not too many, so it's not overwhelming. But at the same time, you need contracts that will give people the right service that they want and reflect different types of services. Uh, but then at the same time, also, you need uh, contracts that will encourage participation in demand response. Um, because, uh, because this is the whole point, you want to reduce these, these costs. You want to encourage the participation. So this, actually designing this set of contracts with all these parameters, this is the central question of my project. Um, so I'm going to be working at uh, La Católica here in Santiago with uh, Professor Daniel Olivares. Um, and we're going to be working on exactly this question of how do we design the set of demand response contracts. Um, and here's an outline of how this is going to go. So the first step is to, we're going to spend time thinking about this question and develop a theory of what is a good set of contracts um, and help us think about that and use that to develop uh, some example sets. Um, we're also going to interface with a social investigation team. Uh, Professor Daniel Olivares is currently working on a big collaborative project where uh, there, is, there are some social investigators who have gone up to Chañarao province to collect survey data actually about, um, about power service and microgrid and smart grid, and we're going to get them to ask about this demand response stuff so we can incorporate it into our work. Then we're going to take the contracts that we developed from our theoretical work, run them through simulations, very complicated technical simulations that will simulate whole grid operations, and figure out do those sets of contracts do what we thought they would? Will they let us rearrange the power load line in a way that makes things nice and efficient while giving people the service that they want? And then finally, if there's time, um, I mentioned that so, so the, the big collaborative project that my advisor is working on, um, they have installed uh, some microgrid systems up in a couple of towns in uh, Chandral province. Um, and if there's time at the end of the project, we'll work on trying to implement uh, the, the contracts that we uh, designed during the project. And the outlook here is that we're taking a, the, the contracts are a small but critical part of uh, moving forward towards having demand response become a ubiquitous and simple fact of, of life so we can uh, enjoy the, the much greater electrical efficiency, the energy savings, um, and so we can all progress towards the sustainable smart grid future. <laughs> yeah, so wait, how am I on time? Uh, yeah, we have like a few, probably like two questions. Or okay, so. gotcha. Uh, uh, lunch, so. um, what's, the, what's the thinking about how, how this will cause like how how this could theoretically cause the onus of a more sustainable future to be placed on like people's um, people being required to or incentivized to comply with a, a yeah with kind of does doesn't this kind of place the the onus of being more sustainable in our power generation on people and how they use their power in their homes? Well, I think uh, that's a great question. Um, I, I, I would really hate it if that was how the, uh, the rhetoric surrounding this went, um, because that's really such a, what, a, what an awful thing that would happen. Because I, I you're right that the, you know, the majority of electrical consumption is not people sitting in their homes. Um, it's an industry. And so it would really be a shame if uh, it was like, you know, big wigs wagging their fingers at, you know, housewives and, and uh, you know, House husbands and such, um, because they're not the real people who are at fault in a non-sustainable situation. However, this is an area where there's an obvious and achievable cost savings and efficiency improvement, and so uh, I think it's not about 
centralizing people's houses and saving the world, but this is one way that we can help uh, be more sustainable and more efficient, and I think it's important that we do it, or try at least. Uh, it's such a big conversation. We'll take one more though. Okay. Yeah, I think al along with her question, my at least one of my concerns with this is that in a liberal society, that this will further promote inequalities that already exist, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. our working class community. This is also why I was going to ask you why you chose Chacarero because. I can very easily see this falling on working class communities who then cannot afford to have the lights on when they're mm -hmm. home and will then have to run their washing machine at 3 or 4 a.m. You know, because that's really the only time that they can afford to have energy. So that's just my, the commodification even of this sustainable energy is something that I worry will only further burden people who already rely so much on debt just to get by, you know? Right, that's a great point. You know, I think, um, I think, uh, when it comes to economic systems, there are many ways that this could play out, right? Um, the economics of it, uh, you know, it, it depends a lot on the way that the regulations work and the way that, you know, uh, a government manages a utility, right? It's, it's a utility after all, and so, um, you know, it's, it would be important to have proper regulations in place. Um, but I guess from my, from my limited knowledge of economics, I would say that my, my first guess, and this is probably naive, um, but if, if, if the result of the demand response process is that um, there's a cost savings, um, then you would assume that, you know, the sort of standard electrical service, like if you opted out of the demand response, would stay at a similar price. And then the sort of, you know, demand response participation options would then simply be cheaper. Um, but I can't make the predictions of how that would play out exactly, unfortunately. I wonder if there's like social scientists that are going to do surveys in other areas, you know, beyond that particular. Like, I'd be interested in going out to poblaciones and, you know, surveying them because I think right. they're honestly going to be the ones that are going to be impacted the most if they have to kind of really gauge at what time they're going to keep the light on, you know? Why did you choose to? Uh, I chose Chile because I was very excited to work with Professor Daniel Olivares. I mean, because this is where he's based. I, I read his research and I was very interested by uh, his, his project that he's working on right now and what he had. And um, I really, uh, we made a good connection. Um, and so it was that relationship that brought me here. I can see lunch is going to be a lively debate, guys. <laughs> 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 so the very last thing.